master class of the AEMC before one lecture. Uh, just to remind you, uh, the final exam, earlier final exam, could be uh, this Thursday, right here, 11 o'clock. If you want to come in, just take, just come in to take. And uh, the key of the review uh, questions will be posted uh, tonight. And uh, I have also have a handouts here. Acquired immune system development, that will be a question for the final exam. I also put it on the UT campus, so you can see it. So if you are here on the lecture, please take one. Okay, that will be a question. So our last class, let's finish talk about it. We're going to talk about virus. Uh, I usually put this in the three years in a row, I put this in at the end. Because you already heard about virus the whole two years. So I don't want to emphasize you too much, but I just we just go over some basic information of the virus. Since we are in this pandemic, and you already learned the microorganism about the bacteria the whole semester, we just talk a little bit about virus. So basically we go over the slides, okay. First of all, virus is an obligate parasite. So this is the key. This is obligate uh, parasite. I will say it's a quotation mark parasite. It's not really a parasite. Which means it's need a host. If it's no host, it will not survive. That I mentioned the last time. If you look at the news, you look at those kind of newspaper or what kind of news says in the packaging bags or packaging stuff, you find the virus, you test the coronavirus, does that mean you're gonna get infected? Maybe not, because they need a host. Now what are the host? That means some could be some of the microorganisms on that packaging bag. There's a host for the virus. So remember, always remember that virus will not survive naturally by itself, they need a host. In other words, virus will not grow on bacteria agar. <coughs> if it's grown the bacteria agar, which means you already have a bacteria layer there, Therefore, these type of virus, we call it bacteria phage. We will mention real quick. Okay, these are the two concepts I want to mention. Because it's a obligate parasites, so they cannot do metabolism independently. They rely on the host. So don't naturally think this piece of paper you had a virus there, it's going to contaminate you. Maybe, may not, most likely not, because there is no host there. You tested, maybe the bacteria on the paper has been their host. So be careful about that. And do not be misleading by some of the news, because obviously the people writing the news, they don't understand the concept of these uh, microorganism knowledge. Okay, they do need a host. It's very slow, could be, only 20 nanometer. Like polio, it could be very large, 400 nanometer, like pox virus. So virus usually, we have to use it, electronized microscope or electronic microscope to do the observation. Using light microscope, we won't see it. It will pass through membranes. What this means? Do you still remember we talk about, if this is a membrane, a membrane filter, Let's say this is 0.22 micrometer. The bacteria will be filtered, will not pass through. However, the virus will go through. So when we're using those membrane filter to filter the virus, a bacteria, it's not that effective for the virus, they will pass through. Last, there is only DNA or RNA, never both. This is also the key, okay? Now, how we classification of virus? We could say it's a 
A-engelbarus, the A-engelbarus. Based on the capsid morphologies, the capsid basically is a protein. We could see the amyloid. So we say it's amyloid or non amyloid and it's a host range. It's going to be an animal virus, plant virus, and the bacterial virus, we call it a bacteriophage. So this is what looks like a structure of a virus. And I tell you, it's very simple. If this is a virus, is that simple? What is this? This is protein. We call it capsids. Now what is inside? Nucleic gases. DNA or RNA. This is the basic structure. It is so simple. Do you still remember bacterial structure? Okay, this is a virus. If you still remember bacterial structure, what it looks like? If you still remember cell membrane, toroid mosaic model, protein. Okay, what is this one? Peptidoglycan. Okay, then it goes on the top. You have these things, ultra membrane system. Okay, then you have these things, like LPS. <coughs> Sometimes you have tachyonic acids, if it's gram positive bacteria. Or, now the bacteria, you have cell membrane, cell wall, peptidin glycan, they put polysaccharides. Of course, it has the genetic information. This is so simple. Therefore, not many drugs, not many antiviral drugs, it works very well. Why? If they are attacking protein, human being has protein, animal has protein, which means the side effects will be very strong. If they are attacking nucleic, nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, I mentioned that's going to be least effective. Why? Lots of mutation will be generated. Now, what is coronavirus looks like? Spike. When you see those spike, like that, that is like a crown. This is what cover ID 19 looks like. Now, when you have these spikes, it's going to shift it. When they shift it, the protein is going to be shifted. So the layer will be shifted. Therefore, lots of mutation could come in. Because the structure is so simple, therefore, not many things, not many drugs, although we developed a lot, let's say, Resivenua, one of the last year, they, in the news, they say some people said it's very effective. But lots of people say it can only reduce the hospitalization rate, not really help too much, which means in the life threatening situations they can use it because the side effects is always strong. So the best way to prevent a virus disease is vaccine. Is the vaccination. You always remember that's the best way to prevent. Once you have it, the only thing you can come back come back it is to improve your immune system. So therefore you have a cold virus when you go to see the doctor, the doctor says, just to take a break, a drink of water. And you may can drink lots of like vitamin C, those stuff. And some of the like uh, air bomb pellets. And uh, because the function is to uh, improve your immune system, therefore itself, it will combat the virus contamination. At the end of the day, you may be, you may be surviving. Okay, so just want to let, let, let you know that structure is too simple. Now, in the other words, when you have a bacteria, we call it attacking cell wall system. The cell wall is most effective, especially peptidin glycan, especially for gram positive bacteria. They're going to be sick. You still remember if gram negative bacteria, this is going to be seen. Okay, well, now this thing has NAG and the NAM. 
those connections. And uh, because human beings do not have a bacteria cell wall, so do not have cell wall, so if any of the drugs attacking the cell wall will be safe for the human being. Now, if it doesn't work, make it antibiotic resistant, we have to attack it cell membrane system. That's not going to be good because human being has cell membrane system too. Therefore, side effects are coming, like lose the hearing, the yellow teeth, and the sample of times will be a decrease your blood cell, white blood cell, affects your bone marrow function. All the side, e side effects are coming. Now, all these things usually as a toxin, like exotoxin, endotoxin. So you see that Complicated structure is always good for the medical people because there are multiple <coughs> points they could develop a drug to attack it. But once it's too simple, it's not very good. So right here you can see the uh, size uh, 10 to uh, 400 nanometer in diameter. <coughs> they containing only nuclear gases, is DNA or RNA, and the protein coat, capsids. Now we have a two different category based on the envelopes. It could be non-enveloped and enveloped. Now I want to ask you, which one is more effective for chemical drugs? And I'll tell you one thing, Suppose, surprisingly, the answer is enveloped virus. Because lots of the chemicals could be attacking that envelope, and that envelope helps the virus is to melt it and also hydrolyze or destroy it in the chemical drugs. The non-enveloped virus is more resistant to the chemical drugs. Okay, so just want to let you know about that. This is some of the morphology. You can see the herpes virus, the rotavirus, the phage, and the um, tail of the phage. Now, by the way, what's a P-H-A-G-E means? Phage, which means you're eating bacteria. When you see this, that means eating bacteria. That's why we call it spot. A tobacco mosaic virus, it's the largest one in all of us you can find it. And the mini virus is also very huge. Now the capsids, what we talk about the capsids is a macromolecular structure, which is a protein coat outside. Right there, the protein coat. That's called a capsid. The capsids usually is a protection function. It also uh, helps for the transfer between the host cells. And then making by different subunits, we call it pro protomers. Now, based on the morphology of the capsids, we could be categorized the virus into helical, isosahedral, and complex. So here are some of the examples. Let's say this tobacco, uh, tobacco mosaic virus. It's very large. You can see this is like a skirt, like the promoter. The promoter composed by capsids is very, very long. And that height there is almost the height of the RNA. Can you see it? It's self assembly And look at here, it's twisted a lot. That range is almost the heart tall, the RNA <coughs> genome. Okay. Icosahedral uh, capsids. When you see this, that is a regular polyhedron by 20 equilateral faces and 12 vertices. So then, those large subunits we call the capsomers. That could be only five or six protomers. So when if, if, if it's five subunits, we call it a petomers. When if it's six subunits, we call it a hexomers. Complex the capsids. This is always is uh, we're going to talk about is a bacteriophage, and uh, you can see the bacteriophage on the top. The capsids head nuclear gases. We have a collar. Looks like here you have a collar. Then you have a thief. You have a base, and then you have a tail. The tail usually going to be attached to the bacterial cell wall, and then the nuclear gases usually will be injected going through this collar and the thief. Now, the genome structure, and I always say that could be single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA. That could be double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA. But remember, it's never both. So um, how large the genome is always uh, decided by the chromosome size. 
That could be very small, only four base pair, and it could be as large as several hundred genes. And uh, we gave you an example, which is influenza virus has a segment of genome composed of the eight separated pieces of RNA. Now always remember, this is called eclipse phase. What that means, which is very unique for a virus, when the virus infects a host, it's not going to show up immediately. During a certain time, they will be hiding in your body and start to do the infection. So let's say you have a cold virus. It does not mean you contaminate it with cold virus. You gonna get a disease immediately. It maybe take about three days to let it be developed in your body. That is called a lipid space. So by all means, says is infectious particles are not observed in the cell at this time. Then later, the infectious, infect, infection, infectious particles will be reappear in the cell. Now we said that the virus is a very specific obligate parasite. So the host specificity is extremely specific. So for example, the phage is specific for the bacteria host. If it's E. coli phage, it's only attacking E. coli. If it's salmonella phage, it's only attacking salmonella. Listeria phage only attacking listeria. Because of they are so specific, so the, we have developed some tool regarding the bacteria phage. So when we talk about the bacteria phage, I said it's very specific. The E. coli is only E. coli. Because it is so specific, so when we develop a bacterial phage, there is a true new, a brand new direction we could talk about. Number one is, of course, some of the new antibacterial chemicals. Those chemicals, some of them synthesized or isolated from the bacterial phage. Let's say some of them coming from E. coli or 157H7. I mean, you can isolate it, the E. coli 157H7 from like eco sample in the cattle. Then you can grab the, some soil from the uh, cattle plants and the farmers' farms, and then you isolate the bacteria phage. My last of them are anti E. coli 157H7. Then we could make those, purify them, and make them antibacterial chemical. And some of them, we even isolated the enzyme from the virus or some of the certain structures, then develop a new antibacterial chemical. Second thing, because it is so specific, so bacterial phage could be a new detect, detective tool to detect E. coli 0157H7. Now remember, how we detect E. coli 0157H7 in the lab? We have to grow them in the bacterial medium. Then we may be using PCR to see the Chagate toxin 1, Chagate toxin 2. Then we may be strict plating to the other to see the signal quality. But we could develop some of the bacterial phage because the phage is so specific. If you use, we label them use fluorescence sometimes, all other chemicals like isotopes. When you see those bacterial phage is showed up in some of the food products, remember it's need a host. What that means, which means they definitely have an E. coli. You understand, for example, let's say there's a meat and the beef. Okay, I'm going to dump the bacterial phage there. Let's say I out isolate to them. Okay, let's say S32, S35. I go there, I don't want to isolate the E. coli over 577 because it takes you so long time. Then I find that. There is some signal that tells me there is a bacterial phage there. What means it? Absolutely there is an E. coli there because it's so specific. Once you find the host, which means you have, you have something there. Okay, so that's another new way to detect, um, to detect uh, the bacteria. But I want to mention something. At the beginning, when people develop antibacterial chemical, they think they can solve the problem of anti- uh, biotic resistance. But the later on people find the phage sometimes even contributes to these resistance. Because when 
because it's so uh, so uh, specific, they will be integrated their genome into the bacterial cell, and later on they're all together. So if you're using two more, you actually are insulated the bacteria, the virus sequencing to the bacterial genome all the time. So people find at the beginning it's maybe something new, but later on they find they also have a side side effects with the development of the new evidence. So just be aware of that. Okay, uh, HIV virus infect only cells displaying CD4, cluster differentiation 4. Um, so that's very specific. Now remember, we've talked about dendritic cells, and then there is a major histocompatibility complex right here. You can see very clearly. That's an area which is attacked by the HIV virus. So that's why you lose the function of the to recognize the foreigner. So that's why HIV patients, we call it the immune deficiency patients. Now this is easy. Some virus are infected many different species. Some of them are specific. Let's say rabies. That could be skunks, dogs, humans, and the bats. So not only you bite by a dog, you have to have an uh, injection of the rabies vaccination. Even if you bite by a bite to by a skunks or some wild animals, you still have to go to see the doctor and have the vaccination of the rabies immediately because this is widely existing in any of the warm blood mammals. So just be aware of that. Okay, how the bacteria go to your body? A very the universal methods and the universal steps, which is attachment. Then entry. Then your uncoating of the genome. Now remember, because it's a, a host specific obligate parasite, so when they synthesis and assemble it, they need to use the host cell machinery. And finally, they're going to be released. And that host cell may be bursted. Maybe uh, they're still there, and then the bacteria, then the virus genome will be into the host. So let's talk about the attachment. What kind of place for the attachments? The attachments, um, usually the viral particles they have. So for example, non envelope of the virus is a capsid. The protein is the uh, attachment site. And the envelope of the virus, the protein in the membrane is that. So ba make sure you understand it. Because we only have these two parts, so attachment is very easy to understand is a protein. Now, the attachment sites recognize receptor sites on the target cell. What are they? That could be any major structure of the bacterial cell. That could be membrane, proteins, polysaccharides, and the lipids. Now, when you do the penetration and uncoating, what are they going to do? The viral membrane will fuse this with the cell membrane. They're going to be engaged. And sometimes, it will be a receptor-mediated endocytosis. This endocytosis will generate an endosome, and it is very similar <coughs> to what we talk about, um, cornobacterial dipseria, because once you come in, it will generate an endosome. This endosome is a very low pH environment, and then finally they will be separated, and then the virus will be inside the cell. Okay, so you look at here, this first one is envelope. They engage the heat. And then, this is all the spikes. And then they're going to change the morphology, then they release inside. The second one is by the endocytosis. They generate an endosome, and that pH is very low. Because of the pH very low, so they hydrolyze the strikes, and then they go inside. This is the last one is unenveloped. That's very simple. They attach to the spikes, and then the genome goes first and they're using the host cell cell machinery to synthesize their own uh, material. <coughs> now the synthesis of viral components is very easy using cell enzymes and the monomers. Of course they're going to do nucleic acids replicate, transfer it to the gene and translate it to mRNA. That's very simple. Those are same as a bacteria but uh, the detail is could be different, it could, could be compl complicated. So we're not going to go detail about that because that's another class called a viral genomic class. Now sometimes 
When they translated the plonking, they have different stages. We call some of them early proteins because they interfere with the cell normal function. And the virus take comments, like say T4 phase virus. And uh, usually they do that first. And uh, their, uh, their structure, like protomers, and other structure proteins, they will be biosynthesis later. So that's why they have uh, early proteins and the later protein, proteins. You always remember, they take in command first, have the early proteins generated, then they develop the, their, those later proteins. This is another picture showed you assembling how they do. So you have a head of protein, pro head, mature head with DNA, the with neck, and then they go inside. And then the collar and the, the base plate, tube, and the seeds, they go the other direction. And finally, they combine, become bacteria fudge. That's a T2 fudge. Now, how they release? <coughs> when you look at here, it's so complicated. But I tell you what's the key words is body. Remember, in the, back in the uh, lab section one, I said, for a fungi, if you have a fungi, they generate their daughter cell. So you will be doing like this. We call it a broad-based body. And this is same for a virus attacking a host. They also do a body. See these spikes? They attach, then they body. And then they release. They generate their own stuff. Now, once you have these spikes, they are attaching the spikes. They will be directed for some of the bleeding, and that bleeding causes hemoglutin. Okay? So that's why sometimes the virus causes the inflammation. Always you see the bleeding, because that terminology for the hemoglutin. Now, we want to talk about a bacteria fudge a little bit. Now, this is something. Uh, <coughs> we can mention a little bit of detail. <coughs> so bacteria fudge is always like this. You see this is the protein. Capsids. And inside, let's say it's a DNA. And we have a T2 fudge. And this is what we call it a cease. And uh, sometimes this is what we call it a base. Okay, when they attach, attacking a bacteria, let's say this is a bacteria, it really depends what type of the phage it is. Let's say this is a bacterial genome. 